Hello and welcome to today's webinar on Total Cost of Ownership from PMMI's OPEX Leadership Network. I'm Joyce Fassel, Editor-in-Chief of Pro Food World at PMMI Media Group, and I'll be moderating this discussion. One of the most significant challenges facing consumer packaged goods manufacturers and original equipment manufacturers is determining the initial purchase price versus the long-term cost of owning capital equipment. During this webinar, we will learn about the initial and negative cash flows of capital equipment investment, the ongoing negative operational cash flows required to utilize that investment, the future positive cash flows that occur as a benefit of the investment, and the eventual gain or loss on disposal or redeployment of the investment. This discussion will provide TCO criteria for both manufacturers and users of capital equipment for use by sales, operations, finance, and more, and also help you develop guidelines and checklists that include all major costs for acquisition, operations, and disposal. I want to let our audience members know that this webinar will also be available for archived viewing at profoodworld.com. You will receive notification when it's ready, and the slides will be available for download from there as well. Please feel free to ask questions at any time during the webinar by typing your question into the questions pane of the GoToWebinar control panel. We will take some time at the end of the presentation to address as many questions as time allows. Before we begin, we have a few words from our sponsors. Allpax uh, designs, manufactures, and supports the customized retorts for in-container sterilization and material handling solutions of packaged goods and beverages. Amec Foster Wheeler designs and delivers and maintains strategic and complex assets for its customers across the global energy and related sectors. Smalley is a manufacturing industry leader in the design and manufacturing of material distribution systems. The core equipment can be customized to meet customers' layouts and specific production needs. And our final sponsor is a platinum sponsor for the OPEX Leadership Network is Mettler Toledo. They are the world's largest provider of inline product inspection equipment backed by global service. The systems deliver unmatched sensitivity with a total cost of ownership for increased profits and brand protection. Now I'd like to begin by introducing our speakers. Medina Allen is currently serving as head coach for CapEx at the FSO Institute. Previously, Medina was Senior Director of Corporate Engineering and Technology for Snyder's Lance, where she developed corporate structure and governance for engineering and technology across the company to include transformational change to capital planning, project management and execution, talent acquisition and development. She was responsible for comprehensive asset management of fixed assets totaling more than $745 million, providing technical leadership, direction, and counsel to R&D, marketing, commercialization, and other key leadership functions. Medina has also held leadership roles with ConAgra Foods, PepsiCo Tropicana, and Procter & Gamble. Terry Miller is a supervising staff engineer for Hormel Foods in Austin, Minnesota. His team of engineers and technicians specify and purchase all process-related equipment for the company. Terry has over 30 years of experience in maintenance and engineering fields. And he or his team have been involved in many different OPEX leadership network programs, including total cost of ownership, factory acceptance testing, sanitary design, and his team is presently working on the RFP process document with OPEX. Now I'd like to turn it over to Steve Schlegel, Managing Director of CMMI's OPEX Leadership Network, who will provide some information about OPEX programs and tools. Steve? Thank you very much, Joyce, and good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, at least good afternoon from the East Coast. We welcome you to this webinar, and it's uh, a really in-depth presentation of information of how uh, both organizations have applied the lessons learned from the best practices developed by the OPEX Leadership Network for broad industry use and adoption. You're looking at this word cloud that gives you a sense of the scale of the breadth and depth 
of the companies involved in the OPEX leadership network. There are over 250 companies who come together and collaborate and try to solve common operational challenges. Uh, the, these groups are made up of manufacturing, engineering, and operational professionals from both the CPG and the supplier community. What is great is that uh, PMMI, who founded the OPEX Leadership Network in 2011, has made a commitment to the industry to provide all of these best practices and protocols for free download for free adoption in the industry. It's important to note that how OPEX defines operational excellence and to provide some common framework by which we look at the work and provide the information to you. As you can see on the screen, we're focused on the needs of the customer, empowering employees, and optimizing processes. It's all three legs of the stool which are vital to operational excellence. Here you get a sense on this wheel of the overall focus of the Op OpEx Leadership Network is people, process, and technology. Nothing magic about that. Many of our companies utilize that verbiage. But here with the people that focus on the human asset at the top of the wheel, here you have protocols and guidelines and best practices on workforce development, workforce engagement, uh, worker safety, as well as uh, PMMI has just launched the uh, Packaging and Processing Women's Leadership Network uh, that is closely aligned with OPEX. To the right side of the screen are the process, and here the focus is on the operational performance within the organization. You will find uh, best practice guidelines on sustainability, OEE, food safety and product safety, and soon to come out uh, later this year on uh, CIP for uh, non-dairy products and cybersecurity or secured vendor access. So look for those in, in uh, the coming months. And to the left side of your screen is technology. Here that is focused on the capital spend. And then by capital spend, the first one in engineering, we're talking about hygienic equipment design. And, and to help you get literally design the level of equipment that you need for the sanitation uh, processes and procedures that you require. Factory acceptance tests. This is a document that will help uh, organizations provide great clarity early in the project in order to have uh, an understanding on how to make sure that you optimize what it is that USCPGs invest. And the purpose for our call today is on total cost of ownership. And more on that as we take a look at what's available for you. On the right side of the screen, you see an infographic. And fundamentally, that big uh, circle right in the middle says that there, this playbook, the TCO playbook and the checklist that you're seeing to the left, really helps your company in four distinct ways. First of all, in the buyer-seller relationship. It creates the opportunity to have that engagement. And you'll hear from our speakers how they have experienced that and share with you some of their, their results. In decision-making, internal as well as the supplier decision-making. But for you CPGs, it's critical to have better, more accurate information so you can make better informed decisions. Internal engagement where to get things done, bringing all of the key stakeholders on board and, and being aligned with the objectives of a capital spend is critical for success and certainly critical for achieving a vertical startup. So as a result, this process, this document, enables that to occur to facilitate communication internally. And last but not least, certainly is the financial benefits that accrue to the organization by following this. So you do get the biggest bang for the buck in your capital spent. The checklists that I referenced are what you see on the screen right now. On the left is the acquisition cost. You can see the graphic behind, behind these are the iceberg, and it's the proverbial analogy of the tip of the iceberg. Acquisition costs 
top of mind to everybody, totally understand it, but what the TCO Solutions Group team did and created this best practice has enabled the CPGs and the OEMs to collaborate and have a better understanding on how their equipment, the purchase, performs not just on the acquisition costs, but on the operating costs. And we're going to go through some examples with you, and, and you'll get a sense of, of what that means. But again, before I turn it over to Terry, who will be our first speaker today, it's important to note that you can go to the opexleadershipnetwork.org and download these documents for free. Uh, they are being widely circulated, and we welcome you to do that. And now, if I may, I turn it over to you, Terry. Thank you very much, Steve. And first of all, I want to thank you for your leadership in allowing CPGs and OEMs to uh, get together with this one voice that's out there and provide these documents to the industry. Uh, it is valuable information. So uh, what I'd like to do is actually go through some items that we've actually gone and done in our process looking at different pieces of equipment. Talk a little bit about the background that uh, Hormel has, uh, the culture that we have, uh, go through some case studies, some some hurdles that we've had to go through, and then the long-range benefits that have come about by adopting the TCO principles in many of the applications that we purchase. So <clears throat> first thing I'd like to do is just talk about and say, you know, Hormel Foods has been committed to the process actually of the OPEX group all the way through it. In my bio, I talked a little bit about the different groups that Hormel has been involved in. And really, we came into this operation or this process very early on. Uh, I think the first document that was done was actually the sanitary design, and we've been committed to bring a standard method to capital equipment purchases and really sharing information throughout industry. Uh, we feel in the food industry that any black eye that any company gets is a black eye to the whole industry, and we do share quite a bit of um, items to be able to move everyone forward. So we are committed also to making sure that we educate our team on the total cost of ownership. We've had many different meetings throughout. Uh, really, we have to have the team effort in the group, and we've got to educate everybody in regard to total cost of ownership to be able to have them buy into what we are looking for. And the one other thing is uh, we buy a very, quite a few pieces of equipment that are really specialized where there might only be one equipment manufacturer out there making that. And you kind of wonder why we would do TCO principles when there's only one out there. But <clears throat> we could learn so much from going through the checklist and working with the vendor and actually improve equipment, make it more reliable, uh, make easier change outs, many different things we've learned as we go through that allows us to be able to uh, do a better job in in our equipment choices that we have out there. So uh, very important that even if there's one out there, this is still a good process to go through. As far as the culture, again, it's a team effort, both internally, externally. Uh, we need to have strong OEM relations to be able to uh, work through every item that's in the uh, checklist. There's there's a lot of things to consider and talk about when we go through and do uh, one of these checklists. Uh, we've really got to let the OEMs know that we are going to go through this. we got to set expectations for what information we need, when we need it by. And uh, another thing that we've got is a culture, as far as breaking our culture, is the least cost capital is not always the right decision. And so often our marketing group comes up and says, we've got a new application, we got to get this out in market, we got to get it out there fast, and they don't want to spend a whole lot of money to do it. And there's times that we have to step back with them and talk through that with them 
and let them know that always, you know, if it is something that really looks promising as far as a new product, that the cheapest thing or the least expensive piece of equipment is not always the right decision to be able to produce that that product. Uh, we've got to break that culture that we have internally, and this document and checklist actually allows us to talk through all the items that we have uh, so people look at things a little differently and it helps us break that culture. One of the case studies I'd like to talk about is uh, vacuum packaging equipment. Typically Hormel Foods purchases 10 to 15 vacuum packaging machines per year and uh, we were purchasing pretty much one standard machine. Uh, had really good luck with them but uh, there's there's some things that we have to look at and make sure that we start comparing all the different machines that are out there. So we put a team together to be able to do that. We define that team. Uh, we put together specifications that are standard specification that each company could look at and put their best foot forward on a machine. Uh, we let them know that we were going to do the TCO uh, checklist along with their bid and we work with those OEMs to define the requirements on the machine and then come back and look at all the items in the TCO checklist. And I put this work with OEMs twice because it is a, a challenge going through with some of the OEMs that have never gone through this process before. There's many questions come up that why do you need this information? What are you gonna do with this? Uh, and when you really explain it to them, they, they fully understand, but it is something that does take their time. It takes our time to be able to do it. We have to assemble that data, sort through it, and then one of the big things is, you know, so many people want to jump to the conclusions of what's the best, but really at that point, you've got to take that data and sit down with our internal teams, our operations teams, our marketing teams, our accounting teams, and engineering group to really look through all the different aspects of the TCO document to be able to get to that final recommendation on what is the best piece of equipment that will meet our needs going forward for many years to come and give us the lowest cost solution for that application. Some of the learnings that we actually got from our process, uh, of course, we're able to identify that lowest cost solution for applications that are out there. Uh, we found many things in dealing with the vendors that were shortcoming specifically on their piece of machinery and were able to talk through some design changes or if the shortcomings were on support, uh, negotiate certain things to be able to enhance that relationship and enhance the overall capital equipment purchase. Uh, we also improve communications internally with our operations and purchasing departments so they know the process that we're going through and that we're looking out for their interest in the long run. And one of the intangible things that I put down on the bottom here, uh, we have a younger engineering group. Uh, you know, I got 30 plus years of experience, but not everybody in our group is, is sitting with that. And what we really have to do is develop our talent internally. And going through this document and seeing every aspect of that checklist and making that engineer think about all these things does wonders for allowing them to make the best decision on items moving forward. Uh, they ask the right questions, they follow through with what they need to follow through with, and it really has done a lot to help us develop our talent internally on our engineering team and I'm sure the operations team and anybody that's been involved in this process. Um, some of the hurdles that we have had to go through, of course, uh, you got to put your team together and educate the team on the benefits. Uh, there's so many times that people just see that this is going to take time and what they don't realize is 
uh, time could save a lot of money in the long run. So taking that time and being able to see out far enough ahead so you have the opportunity to take that time is is really a, a great benefit. Uh, we've got to set expectations. Uh, we did get quite a few pushbacks from OEMs. Uh, I had one meeting that uh, really didn't go well with an OEM and they weren't really interested in doing anything in regard to this. Uh, you'd make decisions based on their uh, ability and, and wanting to be able to help you out with this too. So uh, getting the data collection put together internally and externally. Time constraints is another thing I talked about. Uh, many times we are rushed to get into market with different applications and going through this process is something that we really don't have time to do. Uh, if we could see ahead of time and work with our marketing people and know some of this stuff is coming and have that open communications, we could be ahead of the game and be able to get this done by the time that they say, hey, here's the money, go buy this equipment. We've already done our, uh, our research. Of course, Many times our operations group or marketing wants you to have the least cost to enter market and uh, least cost isn't always the right thing to do. Uh, unique equipment needs, many times there's only one piece of equipment out there so going through this process some people ask why would you do that. I kind of explained the benefits of that. And then one of the last things I wanted to talk about as far as hurdles, you can go through this whole process and look at all the different pieces of equipment that are out there, come up with a, a solution, but yield, if one piece of equipment may provide you 1% yield increase over another piece of equipment that you'd have to measure out, uh, that might just be the driving decision over all the time that you have that machine, 1% on you know, 10 million pounds per year makes a big difference. And that cost may just drive your decision not really looking at the actual operating costs or utilities or something like that. Benefits to our group was, uh, you know, we go out and buy a lot of equipment and sometimes you get familiar with equipment and you just go buy it because it's worked before. Uh, we really have to look across the board at the same pieces of equipment to make sure that we are still buying the best thing out there. As technology increases, uh, other people might jump ahead of the curve on technology and come out with something completely different or, or a lot better than what the other competitors are and we've got to keep ahead of that and that allows us this whole document allows us to keep out there and understand what everybody's doing of course it gives us a documented method and gives you that one voice so OEMs in at some point in time as we roll this out and get it out to OEMs and CPGs and we're all talking the same voice this is going to be something that we could just say, hey, we got to do a TCO document. OEMs will understand what we're talking about. Education, we talked about that. Uh, just educating our team on capital equipment purchases, making sure that we do the best thing moving forward. Uh, we drive our OEMs to partner partners to improve their equipment. And really in the long run, we're here to improve the bottom line of our company by providing that best solution for the piece of equipment that we have to purchase. Uh, that's really the driving factor be behind all of our jobs and hopefully what this will do for each person out there uh, as, as they utilize these documents moving forward. With that, I guess I'm going to introduce Medina Allen from the FSO Institute. Medina? Thanks, Terry. Um, so now that Terry has provided a real-world example of how Hormel is utilizing TCO, I will cover a few other applications of TCO across industry, which include case studies on base analysis, very similar to the vacuum pack example that Terry just covered, 
um, program analysis, and equipment continuity analysis as well. When we think of base analysis, it is a com comprehensive view of acquisition and operating costs of the TCO playbook that can provide perspective on points of differentiation that can impact an organization's long-term fixed asset costs. As we shift to looking at program analysis, it provides a platform to review and continually improve existing work processes such as RFP, FAT, and engineering design workflows. By leveraging TCO, learnings can be used to identify and resolve gaps that may exist in any system. Lastly, we will look at a standardized approach to equipment continuity, which leverages TCO principles to maximize current assets and avoid new capital purchases when the organization has viable existing or idle assets that can be used. The goal of all of these applications is to improve the value of capital, um, provide better visibility and management of fixed assets, as well as create the ability to avoid capital spending that is not required. Now we'll take a look at a few of the case studies in each area. In the first case, we will be evaluating a new packaging line that is currently in a traditional work system. The project must deliver new equipment, new product, and a new work system for operations to successfully blend people, process, and technology. Additional expectations of the project include creating internal model of operations work system, internal and external teamwork, partnership cross-functionally, uh, CPG to OEM, OEM to installation contractor, as well as leveraging TCO methodology to acquire best assets to support new operations work systems. Based on deliverables and expectations, the key areas of TCO that were focused on by the team during this case included, but were not limited to, maintenance, OEM customer service, spare parts inventory, ease of cleanability, operability, and changeover, warranty, and FAT. Based on this case, the team learned how to strategically apply and adopt the TCO tool. The value of analyzing TCO cost of acquisition as well as projected operational costs. The team also learned the value of key differentiators in selecting vendors and that teamwork across CPG and OEM is paramount. Now we will transition to a case that applied the tools to a significant infrastructure project for a plant, wastewater treatment. In this example, the system design must support a multi-plant site that has different manufacturing processes with varying wastewater loads. In this design, the system has to consider current and future manufacturing needs with a special consideration for new permit requirements, resource conservation, and remote management. Additional expectations include more efficient equipment with consideration for operational costs, partnership cross-functionally, CPG to OEM, OEM to contractor, as well as leveraging TCO methodology to acquire the best assets to deliver the site goal. Based on the deliverables and expectations, the key areas of TCO that were focused on by the team during this case included, but weren't limited to, system design, technology vetting, chemical usage, staffing requirements, permit requirements, as well as environmental considerations. As a result of this case, the team learned team alignment on the project goals is critical throughout the life of the process. The TCO tool helped to uncover vendor capability and identify strategic partnerships, as well as leveraging TCO for major infrastructure projects can help with best investment of capital and business continuity. We have now covered two examples of base TCO analysis and application. And we'll move on to programs. As we looked at program application, 
it was key that we looked across all processes that have connectivity to TCO as an input or an output. For standardization purposes and adoption of TCO checklists, each organization is able to right-size the tool to fit within its existing early management engineering workflow or procurement workflow. Key expectations as it relates to this application included key stakeholder engagement and alignment on differentiators, incorporating and refreshing existing processes to have comprehensive view of assets, as well as strategic decision making on capital versus expense expenditures. The main focus areas of TCO covered in the programs scenario were to interconnect RFP and FAT, and also to apply methodology of acquiring and operating an asset on the front end of an acquisition. Some of the key learnings and outcomes from this program analysis included creation of a framework for value added discussions on assets, opportunity to identify partnering relationships, an opportunity to improve processes to be more integrated to ensure that any gaps are identified and filled, as well as management of capital more effectively by identifying the needs early. TCO also aligns very well with early management and engineering methodology. So now we'll shift gears and we will talk a little bit about how do we apply this tool to a standard work process of equipment that is currently in operation to ensure that we are leveraging the tool in a way that helps us to maximize our capital value. So what we would do is we would leverage the checklist to evaluate equipment, identify um, the best candidates internally of that equipment. The next step would be to leverage an equipment continuity matrix that uh, lays out the status of the equipment, new used or modified. Um, by normally modified means that it's something that has been improved by the CPG. And in some cases, it could be CPG and OEM. Um, also, we would look at information uh, relevant to the operation of those unit ops, uh, such as rate. Uh, cleanability and operability, safety are all considerations. The next step in the process is to leverage it with a new project as a, a vetting tool to determine do we have the capability existing with an asset or do we really need to go and purchase new. And what we would do is identify the best candidate should we have internal assets available and evaluate it thoroughly through the TCO checklist. Next, we will look at how we would apply a potential matrix. Um, this example has a packer, and it basically states where it's located in the organization, the last update it received, um, things critical to the current operation and performance of that asset, that would help you to understand whether or not it would be appropriate to repurpose it internal to the organization. Now we will transition to closing this webinar out by sharing some key takeaways. And based upon the cases that Terry and I have shared, we want all of you to walk away with the key point that TCO is a team effort internally to the CPG as well as a partnered approach with CPG and OEM. Um, it is not meant to be an adversarial type of engagement. It is meant to drive strategic partnerships. It also helps to establish the one voice between the CPG and the OEM very early so that we can minimize changes that happen later in the project that tend to cause lots of money. Also, TCO educates the entire organization on assets overall value and its versus its initial cost. In doing such, we can look at TCO from the perspective of base program 
as well as equipment continuity. And improve how capital is delivered to an organization. So with that, I will turn this over to our moderator, Joyce Fassel, for questions. Okay, I'd like to thank Medina and Terry for a great presentation on total cost of ownership, as well as I'd like to thank our sponsors, Mettler Toledo, Amec Foster Wheeler, Smalley Manufacturing Company, and All Packs. And now we're gonna take some questions from the audience. Um, the first question says, is it normal to experience uh, continual education on TCO as the organization is adopting TCO? Uh, Terry here. I guess I would say yes. We, uh, as an organization, have a uh, promote within uh, culture and many people are changing jobs from one to another. Uh, my operations group, probably every two to three years, has new people that move from one spot to another. And I do see this as a continuous improvement that we do have to do the education to inform everyone why some of the decisions are made the way they are and why we make recommendations the way we do. Uh, if everything was static, I think that that could be minimized, but uh, we don't live in a static world. We live in a world where we have to continuously make sure that we grow talent and bring new people up to understand the ramifications of the decisions that we all make. Hey, Terry, I'd like to oh, echo okay. those comments um, and also add that uh, it, it is quite normal to have the education piece, especially when you have large teams that span across um, different generations of how uh, capital was used and is now currently transitioning to be used across industry. So I think that will continue and it is totally normal to feel like I feel like every time I'm talking about TCO, I'm learning something new um, because you will be. Um, and as we continue to socialize this and adopt it across CPG and OEM, naturally learnings come out of that process across the board. Some of them will be common, some of them won't be common, and they will feed back into the overall picture to help us get better um, cohesively. Okay, our next question says, is it recommended to utilize TCO on small capital projects, such as um, building improvement of welfare areas, such as you know the locker room? Hey, Terry, I'll take that one. I, I would err on the side of caution with applying TCO to something in in that space because as I look at TCO, I'm looking at major capital or major infrastructure that's required to um, deliver cases of product. And albeit welfare space is very important, I view that as a go-do versus TCO, we need to analyze what type of rocker we get. I, I agree with that comment. Uh, you know, I, I look at what projects that we would actually look at, and it would be larger equipment processes that we've got uh, that are really going to be a huge impact as we go forward. Uh, usually building and welfare, this is your cost that you put into it, and there isn't that ongoing savings or additional costs moving forward in many of those applications where the machinery that you have producing products probably have more of an impact on overall cost over the life of that asset. Okay, our next uh, audience member wants to know, based on the case studies that you've shared, you've shown uh, that TCO has been leveraged in a few applications. What is the best way to start using the tools? Terry here, I, you know, what you really have to do is be committed to it and jump into it and pick something to start the process. 
again, this process is there's there's a lot of aspects of it and a lot of education that has to be done to be able to get into it. And the only way really to do it is to pick a project and, and start working on it. Uh, familiarity, again, you go back to that and you could you could order equipment based on what you've ordered in the past. Uh, but really when you open up your eyes and see all those items that are in that checklist and start really crossing the T's and dotting all the I's on all the aspects of the cost of that machinery, uh, that's when the light bulb goes off for a lot of people and they realize that this is really something that is a benefit to be able to go through. And you just have to be committed to it and start moving forward and pick something that you're working on and start the process. I would echo that um, as well, Terry. And I would just add that um, in most organizations, there is a, a critical project where deep analysis financially and on the, the business imperatives strategic side needs to happen. That would be my starting point because you're going to automatically get a certain level of organizational support to do a different level of analysis. So I would focus on a high impact project because you're going to definitely um, have that level of commitment that you spoke of. Okay, the next question is uh, talks about your approach to t TCO. And this person says, in order to have an adequate approach to t TCO, is there a need for the organization to embrace lean thinking? Um, Ed, 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 you want to take that one first? Well, I'm just <sighs> lean thinking. You've, you've got to embrace that and you've got to think about that moving forward. TCO is somewhat detached from that. Uh, as, as I think about that, the, the best process uh, moving forward might be a little bit away from the lean thinking mode when you, when you come down to it. Um, lean as far as inventory, lean as far as people, those are all items that we talk about in the TCO checklist that get put into the overall decision of what you are doing. So really, if you're following through with the checklist, that is one of the items that you are considering before you make the recommendations on what you want to do moving forward on the piece of equipment. To embrace it completely, I don't know if that's the case, but really you have to take that into consideration before you make your recommendation, and that is brought forth in the checklist information as, as you fill this out. I, I would add to that that strategically organizations align on what uh, continuous improvement philosophy they want to champion. And lean is one of those that a lot of people are gravitating to, which to Terry's point, in, in any of the work that we're doing with TCO, we have to consider that. And it's a part of you going through the analysis. So it's somewhat baked into that process. You can't necessarily decouple it and and still deliver an organization's expectation around lean. Um, and so I would default to each organization has its platform and how we leverage this tool needs to align with that platform. Okay, our next uh, question says, how do you evaluate the cost of specific design criteria you request in comparison with an industry standard-based equipment design? So I can repeat the question, how do you evaluate the cost of specific design criteria you request in comparison with an industry standard-based equipment design? Well, that's a fun one to deal with all the time. Uh, Hormel Foods has a basic equipment specification that we send out for all capital equipment purchases. <clears throat> Many OEMs get a hold of that document and say, well, that isn't how we build our machinery. And we say, well, we need that machinery built to these requirements. Sanitation is 
really something that we can't we can't compromise on. We have to have equipment built specific ways to be able to do that. Um, so what we try to do is level the playing field, knowing that our bar might be set up a little bit higher than somebody else's and we aren't dealing with standards anymore. Uh, what we ask in a bid package when it comes back, <clears throat> do you meet these specifications? And if there is any deficiencies, please note that uh, in in your bid package itself. Then we have to take a look at that and really look at what the cost of that increase is. Um, face it, there's times when we need a piece of machinery and they want it fast and the only thing we can really do is purchase something that is industry standard. But we really work with our our OEMs out there to be able to put that bar up higher and we understand that it's going to cost us more but in the long run it's going to cost us less by doing those things to be able to allow us to clean machinery better to support the machinery better to have better reliability in that piece of machinery over the life and the as asset itself so uh, Again, what we do is we stand back and we say, here's our bar, let us know if you don't meet it, and we actually have to look at the risks then if they don't meet it um, and determine if that's what we want to do moving forward. So we understand there's going to be increased costs, and we have to look subjectively at the costs for doing those specific things that we're asking for. Okay, our next um, audience member would like to know, as engineering groups get leaner, how do you quantify the value of adding time and re resources to exploring TCO? I'll, I'll take that one. I, I think this has to become a, a part of the workflow process, so it's not new work. Um, it's an integral part of how you go about doing the work that's already there. So it's a tool to be leveraged with existing processes more so than it is recreating a process. And with any introduction of a, a new tool, there is time required for the education piece. There is time required to um, implement and sustain the knowledge that is required to move fast with using a tool like this so I would expect that if people are experiencing you know uh, time crunches with being able to get through the information it may be due to the newness of it and it will go away once the education and the socialization internal to the company and external to the company is elevated so um, yeah Terry any other comments and I agree with that as far as the time base. And as we educate our engineers, uh, you know, we look at so many different pieces of equipment. And for every piece of equipment, do you have to actually go through the 15-page TCO checklist? Um, be honest with you, probably not. But to have that background and understand the documents and be able to ask the specific questions that you need to on pieces of equipment, you could really narrow some of this down. Now, we don't want to change. We want everybody to work off of the checklist as is. But we also want to make sure that we could streamline that process and sometimes be able to make educated decisions based on specific questions, maybe not every question. and having to meet with the op marketing and operations group but be able to come up with in our internal group the best decision on what we do moving forward and again education being one of those benefits out of this whole process that allows my engineers to look at a piece of equipment I mean we could go out to a trade show and we could learn so many things just by looking at a piece of equipment and not actually having to go through a TCO document, but just understanding what to look for when we're out there looking at stuff. Okay, our next uh, question refers to um, time, speed to market and project timelines. So this person wants to know, how does full TCO implementation deal with issues involving speed to market and project timelines? Oh. 
Well, I could go through a, a case study that we're dealing with right now. Uh, we had a marketing group that came in and said that they wanted a, a new product put out. And uh, we told them how much it would be based on our best decision and the equipment that we would say would work well for that. Uh, another organization came in, it was a kill packer, and said, well, we could get you into market with this product for this much less by using other equipment that uh, Hormel probably wouldn't have purchased. Uh, in the meantime, we started this process up, and I've had a director, product manufacturing manager, three engineers in this facility for, I'm going to say in the neighborhood, a total three and a half months of time between all that group trying to get a line started up because we put in equipment that probably Hormel wouldn't have purchased ourselves uh, being a least cost solution. The cheapest thing doesn't always get you to market faster. Uh, the most expensive thing doesn't always get you to market faster. But being able to understand the best piece of equipment with the best support that's out there, if you are under a real time crunch to get something to market, uh, <clears throat> you really have to look at that aspect and understand that we don't have time to spend three and a half months worth of our labor trying to get equipment up and running in somebody else's facility uh, to be able to hit a market launch for product. Okay, we have a number of questions that um, are referring to um, the, how you make your estimations using TCL. This person, um, Terry, said you mentioned basing your decision because of a 1% difference. And when determining C, uh, TCL, are there any estimates, estimations that you use that could impact the outcome of your, of your decision, and how do you ensure that these estimates are as accurate as possible? Uh, experience is one thing that really does make a difference. Being able to, let's say with yield, we would actually want to bring a piece of machinery in and determine uh, with a real live test if that actually meets that requirement. Uh, face it, there's a lot of people out there that say they could <clears throat> slice cheese sideways and backwards in every itch, which way, and when you really bring the machinery in, it doesn't quite do what they say. Um, that is one thing that we really have to do is make sure we bring in live equipment and be able to test. Um, you know, when you when you go through a lot of the other items, utility costs, and that's pretty much fixed cost. Uh, determining change over times, that's another item that's in there. You know, changeovers are huge. Uh, not just the time to change it over, but then dialing the machine in to get it to operate afterwards. And you really look at, you know, how organized they are, what do they have for tools to be able to set up changeovers, are there dial indicators to be able to place everything and get it back into position, how many parts are we doing when we do changeovers, and a lot of that is being out in the field and, and working with this machinery and understanding what it takes to do that and the complexity of some of the things that we have to do. So there is some subjectivity in regard to this. Uh, really, it comes with experience, so to be able to put some of these numbers together. Our next couple of questions um, have to do with uh, equipment suppliers. Do you find that, uh, this person wants to know, do you find that uh, you are working with the same suppliers project after project to build a relationship, or are you always looking at new suppliers? It's a com I, I would say it's a combination. So you have uh, OEMs that are standardized and preferred, but you're always trying to make sure that you are competitive at looking at technology as well as cost. Um, with the climate being what it is across food, CPGs, and uh, <clears throat> the pressure to deliver more with less, you, you have to always balance that looking at 
the same versus looking at new OEMs. And so, Terry, I'll, I'll turn it over to you to see if there's a different perspective on that. Well, we work with a number of preferred vendors. Uh, we take the opportunities at the trade shows to be able to look at a lot more vendors that are out there, and then we pick the, the cream of the crop out. And what Hormel's actually done is put together a an equipment vendor summit where we bring in like vendors that really make the same piece of equipment, and we've sat down with them and laid out our requirements for capital equipment purchases. Uh, you know, we might have four vacuum packaging companies in that and some other similar companies where we sit down in the same room, let them know exactly what our requirements are and uh, and work with them. Uh, we tend to not migrate a lot. I mean, we don't deal with one vendor, but we may deal with four vendors and we keep everybody honest and we'd go through bid processes as required. Uh, to be able to make sure that we've got the best piece of machinery out there for the least cost of ownership over the life of that machine. Okay, have OEMs started to adopt TCO beyond the playbook and checklist? I would answer that as a yes, they have, but it is a slow start. Um, the CPG's commitment to implementing TCO will help to speed up that slow start with the OEM. Terry, any from, from what we've heard or what we've seen out there, uh, we ask, are you guys familiar with total cost of ownership and the OPEX group? And a lot of them say, we've heard of it. And that's about all that they have said. And then we start bringing forward the documents and start talking to them. And uh, it seems like a lot of their senior leadership probably has experience with this and has seen it and heard of it. But it hasn't probably gotten down to the individual regional sales managers that we end up talking with until it comes through their channels and the two of them meet up and start discussing what's required. So it's out there. I think that, uh, like I say, that they've heard of it, but uh, like I said, it probably isn't down to the level where the sales managers understand what's going on or know what's coming at them when we ask that we're going to go through a TCO checklist on a capital equipment purchase. Well, we have time for one final question, and what would you say is the biggest benefit of adopting and actively applying TCO? The bottom line of the company is really what it comes down to, uh, being able to educate our people to make better decisions and really to be able to leverage that capital equipment purchased to make the best benefit for the company. I mean. That's really what we're here to protect is our company's bottom line and make sure that we do the best decision making that we can for those purchases that we've got. Well, once again, I'd like to thank Medina and Terry for their great presentation on total cost of ownership. And for the latest news about engineering and operations in food and beverage manufacturing and to view news about our upcoming web webinars, visit profoodworld.com. Thank you for attending this presentation and have a great day.